The screaming started at 9.01. On the night of January 3rd, 1961, deep in the Idaho desert, three young men were alone with America's most dangerous experiment. Specialist John Burns, 22 years old, Specialist Richard McKinley, 27, and Chief Electrician Richard Legg, 26. They were restarting SL-1, a prototype nuclear reactor built by the Army to power remote military bases, 200 kilowatts of electricity, 400 kilowatts of heat, enough to keep a small outpost running in the Arctic or the middle of nowhere. What happened next lasted four milliseconds. Before we dive in, please consider dropping a like and subscribing. The reactor had been shut down for 11 days over the holidays, standard procedure, but bringing it back online required delicate work. The control rods that managed the nuclear reaction had to be manually reconnected to their drive mechanisms. Rod number nine needed to be pulled out exactly four inches, just enough to reattach the drive. McKinley was at the controls. Burns stood nearby. Leg worked directly above the reactor vessel. The procedure was routine, practiced, safe, except someone pulled rod nine 20 inches instead of four. Inside, the reactor core sat 14 kilograms of 93% enriched uranium-235, weapons-grade nuclear fuel packed into 40 aluminum-clad assemblies. When Rod 9 came out too far, it removed the barrier holding back a chain reaction. Prompt criticality, the most feared phrase in nuclear engineering. In four milliseconds, the reactor's power spiked from 3 megawatts to 20,000 megawatts, 20 gigawatts of uncontrolled nuclear energy. The core temperature instantly reached 4,000 degrees Fahrenheit. The water surrounding the fuel assemblies flash-boiled into superheated steam. The pressure wave hit the reactor vessel like a sledgehammer. 26,000 pounds of steel and concrete shot upward nine feet into the air. A shield plug ejected from the top of the vessel at 85 feet per second. It struck Richard Legg and pinned him to the ceiling 40 feet above the reactor. The other two men lay motionless on the operating floor. The first rescue team entered at 10.38. They found McKinley alive but dying. Massive radiation exposure, internal injuries from the blast. He was pronounced dead at 11.14. Burns was found near the control panel, dead instantly from the steam explosion and a lethal dose of radiation. Leg remained pinned to the ceiling. When rescue workers finally reached him, his body was so radioactive it registered 1,500 Roentgens per hour on contact enough to kill anyone who touched him. 30 first responders were contaminated that night, scrubbed down with potassium permanganate, hosed off like toxic waste. 22 people received between three and 27 Roentgens of whole body radiation exposure. The ambulance that carried McKinley's body became so contaminated it had to be taken off the highway. But the real horror was just beginning because SL-1 wasn't just a reactor accident. It was America's first nuclear disaster and nobody knew how to clean it up. The radiation plumes spread across the Idaho desert like an invisible wildfire. 1,100 curies of radioactive fission products escaped into the atmosphere, 80 curies of iodine-131 alone. The winter wind carried the contamination southeast toward the small town of Atomic City. Residents had no idea death was blowing over their homes. Detection stations downwind picked up krypton, xenon, strontium-91, and yttrium-91 radioactive isotopes that shouldn't exist outside a reactor core. But there was no evacuation order, no warning sirens. The Atomic Energy Commission classified SL-1 as a level four incident on the international nuclear event scale, an accident with local consequences. Local consequences, as if radiation respected property lines. The cleanup began immediately, not to protect the public, but to hide the evidence. 790 people were eventually involved in the recovery operation, each one monitored, each one exposed. The reactor vessel itself was so radioactive it couldn't be approached by human beings. They used robots and cranes operated from behind lead shields. Piece by piece, they dismantled the upper structures of the reactor building, reducing radiation fields just enough to recover the bodies. By November 29, 1961, they finally removed the reactor vessel using a specially designed shielded crane system. The entire structure was buried in a dedicated site 1,600 feet northeast of SL-1. 99,000 cubic feet of contaminated debris and soil joined it by September 1962. An entire reactor, three human beings, and everything they touched, buried in the Idaho desert. Today it's managed as a Superfund site, 
Operable Unit 505 under the Environmental Protection Agency. The burial ground will remain dangerous for centuries. But the Atomic Energy Commission needed answers. What went wrong? How did a routine maintenance procedure kill three men and contaminate 40 square miles of desert? The reactor was designed as a direct cycle, natural circulation boiling water reactor, three megawatts of thermal power, simple, compact, perfect for remote military installations. Five cruciform cadmium control rods managed the nuclear reaction. When inserted, they absorbed neutrons and stopped the chain reaction. When withdrawn, the reactor produced power. The investigation found that with all other control rods inserted, Rod 9 became critical at 17.3 inches of withdrawal, prompt critical at 19.5 inches. They found Rod 9 stuck at 20 inches. But why was it withdrawn so far? The procedure called for 4 inches. Experienced operators knew the limits. These weren't rookies playing with nuclear fire. Burns had been trained on the system. McKinley knew the procedures. Leg had worked on reactor maintenance for months. Theories emerged. Sabotage. A love triangle between the operators. Deliberate destruction. The rumor mill fed on the secrecy surrounding the accident. The official investigation found no evidence of sabotage. No proof of foul play. The cause was listed as unknown. But the technical facts painted a different picture. The energy release was equivalent to 133 megajoules, about 32 kilograms of TNT, two millionths the power of Hiroshima, but concentrated in a space the size of a telephone booth. Peak pressure at the top of the reactor vessel reached 10,000 pounds per square inch. The water hammer effect launched the entire 26,000 pound assembly nine feet into the air in milliseconds. No human being could survive that kind of violence. Before we jump back in, tell us where you're watching from today. And if this story hits you, make sure you're subscribed so you don't miss the next one. The autopsies revealed the full horror of what happened inside SL-1 that night. The bodies told a story no one wanted to hear. Los Alamos document LAMS-2550 detailed the autopsy procedures for all three victims. The findings were classified for decades. When they were finally released, they revealed the true power of what happened inside SL-1. Richard Legg's body had absorbed so much radiation the parts of him registered 1,500 rangens per hour on contact. The autopsy team had to work in shifts. Five minutes maximum exposure time. Any longer, and they would have received lethal doses themselves. This wasn't just death by explosion. This was death by nuclear fire. The three men had been exposed to neutron radiation, gamma rays, and radioactive particles simultaneously. Their cells were destroyed at the molecular level, DNA shredded. Organs liquefied from the inside out, but they died too quickly to suffer radiation sickness. The steam explosion killed them first. A mercy compared to what radiation would have done over days or weeks. John Burns, Richard McKinley, and Richard Legg became the first and only immediate fatalities of a U.S. reactor accident. Their deaths marked a line in nuclear history that has never been crossed again. The Joint Committee on Atomic Energy held radiation safety hearings from June 12 to 15, 1961. The Atomic Energy Commission was forced to acknowledge weaknesses in emergency planning, gaps in safety protocols, failures in reactor design. Before SL-1, reactor operating procedures were a few pages long. After SL-1, they expanded to hundreds of pages. The one stuck rod criterion was adopted across the nuclear industry no single control rod withdrawal could ever again add enough reactivity to cause prompt criticality. Withdrawal rate limits were installed on control drives. Human factors training became mandatory. Higher range radiation instruments were added to every facility. The lessons learned from three deaths in the Idaho desert shaped every nuclear reactor built afterward. But the contamination lingered and the questions multiplied. The United States Geological Survey characterized the hydrology beneath the National Reactor Testing Station. The Snake River Plain sits on porous basalt rock. Water moves through it like a sponge. Contamination could spread underground for miles. Aerial gamma surveys were conducted in 1974, 1982, 1990, and 1993. Each one detected residual radiation from the SL-1 accident. Decades after the burial, the desert was still glowing. The Environmental Protection Agency's records of decision concluded that long-term management would require permanent burial ground controls and continuous monitoring, forever. The price tag for containing SL-1's contamination has never been fully calculated. 
790 people involved in recovery operations, specialized equipment, remote handling systems, a dedicated burial ground, ongoing monitoring for centuries, all to clean up four milliseconds of uncontrolled nuclear reaction. The Army's nuclear ambitions didn't end with SL-1. The ML-1 mobile reactor achieved full power on February 28, 1963, but the program was already dying. The accident had exposed fundamental flaws in the concept of portable nuclear power. Small reactors required the same safety measures as large ones, but they couldn't justify the cost. The economics never worked. The risks were too high. The 80 Curies of Iodine-131, released from SL-1, seemed small compared to Fukushima's release of 10 to the 17th Becquerels. Millions of times less radiation, but SL-1's impact wasn't measured in Curies alone, it was measured in trust lost, confidence shattered, the promise of clean, safe nuclear power tainted by the image of three young men dying alone in the desert. A memorial plaque honoring Burns, McKinley, and Leg was finally dedicated in 2022 at the Experimental Breeder Reactor site, 61 years after their deaths. 61 years of silence broken, but their legacy lives on in every nuclear facility operating today, in every safety system, every procedure, every backup plan designed to prevent another SL-1. The question remains, was their sacrifice worth it? Today, nuclear power provides 20% of America's electricity. 100 reactors operating across 30 states, not one has killed a worker through radiation since SL-1. The transformation was born from three deaths in the Idaho desert. Every reactor built after 1961 incorporated lessons written in blood at 9.01 on January 3rd, multiple independent shutdown systems, passive safety features that work without human intervention, containment structures designed to hold back full meltdowns. The engineering philosophy changed completely. But SL-1's shadow extends beyond technical improvements. It fundamentally altered how the nuclear industry thinks about risk. Three Mile Island, 1979, Chernobyl, 1986, Fukushima, 2011. Major nuclear accidents that made global headlines, but none killed workers immediately through reactor operations like SL-1. The distinction matters. SL-1 remains America's only reactor accident with immediate operator fatalities, a singular event in the history of nuclear power. The site where SL-1 stood is now part of Idaho National Laboratory. The building was demolished, the reactor vessel buried, the ground monitored continuously for residual contamination. But 1,600 feet away, the burial ground sits like a monument to hubris, 99,000 cubic feet of radioactive debris slowly decaying beneath the desert floor. Half-lives measured in centuries. Current readings show contamination levels within regulatory limits. The phrase, within limits, carries weight here. Not safe, not clean. Just legally acceptable for indefinite storage. Today's energy debates rarely mention SL-1. Nuclear power is discussed in terms of climate change, carbon emissions, renewable alternatives. The human cost seems forgotten in spreadsheets and policy papers. The military's dream of portable nuclear power has been revived. Small, modular reactors, advanced designs promising inherent safety, micro-reactors for remote installations and space exploration. The same promises made in 1958, compact, reliable, Safe. NASA plans nuclear reactors for Mars colonies. The Department of Defense funds portable reactors for forward operating bases. The cycle continues with better technology but familiar assumptions. Modern designs incorporate SL-1's lessons, negative temperature coefficients, inherent shutdown mechanisms, walk-away safe operation, engineering improvements built on the foundation of three young men's deaths. Industry leaders speak confidently about new safety measures, passive systems, simplified designs, the inevitability of human error addressed through engineering. But SL-1 demonstrated something deeper than technical failure. It revealed the gap between theoretical safety and operational reality, between what engineers design and what humans actually do. Rod 9 was supposed to be withdrawn four inches, someone pulled it 20 inches. The difference between routine maintenance and instant death measured in 16 inches of metal Decades of human factors research followed, understanding why experienced operators make fatal mistakes, stress, fatigue, overconfidence, groupthink, the psychology of high-stakes decision-making. Nuclear operators now train in full-scale simulators. 
emergency scenarios repeated until responses become automatic. The goal is to eliminate the human factor that killed Burns, McKinley and Legg, but every safety system ultimately depends on humans. Designers, builders, operators, regulators, the chain of human decision-making that determines whether nuclear technology serves or destroys. John Burns dreamed of a career in nuclear engineering. Richard McKinley planned to return to civilian life after his army service. Richard Legg was engaged to be married. They became footnotes in nuclear history, their names engraved on a plaque dedicated 61 years too late. The desert remembers what we forget. Contaminated soil buried beneath warning markers. Radioactive debris slowly decaying in concrete tombs. The physical evidence of what happens when nuclear power goes wrong. Millions of Americans live within 50 miles of nuclear reactors today. They trust in systems designed after SL-1. Safety measures, written in the blood of three young men who died alone in the Idaho desert. The question isn't whether nuclear power is safe. The question is whether we remember why it became safe. Whether the lessons of SL-1 survived the engineers who learned them. Because the next reactor accident is always one human mistake away, one control rod pulled too far, one safety system ignored. One moment when the impossible becomes inevitable. If this story made you think differently about nuclear power, drop a comment below and let us know. And if you believe in learning from disasters to prevent future ones, hit that subscribe button, because the only way to honor the dead is to ensure they didn't die in vain. The desert keeps its secrets, but some secrets are too important to bury.